Good morning to everybody. I want to welcome you to our annual Global Ophthalmology Grand Rounds. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today to introduce our speakers to you, but I'm going to turn over our introductions for our first speaker over to Dr. Emmy Hartnett. <clears throat> but I just want to let you know that exciting things are happening in global outreach. Uh, we're just starting to gear up back again with some of our international work, so we're excited about that. Uh, but there'll be a flurry of activity throughout the academic year that we're just so excited to share with you all as the year progresses. And there's always room for engagement and for involvement for everybody at every single level. So at this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Hartnett to come up and introduce our first speaker, uh, who we've been privileged to have here for the past year. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Maria Margarita Parra, who is going to speak to you today. And I think many of you already know her and may have helped her with her first time seeing snow and also in skiing here in Utah. So she completed a residency in ophthalmology at the Ophthalmologic Foundation of Santander in Bucamaranga, and then a two-year medical surgical fellowship in retina and vitreous at the same institution. And in about, uh, about two years ago, she contacted me to ask to do a pediatric retina observership because her country wanted her to come back and start the first pediatric retina center in Columbia. And so with the support of Dr. Olson and the now late Dr. Crandall, we cr created an observership for her and she's done very well. She's worked here and also at Primary Children's and she's received an Academy of Ophthalmology award. She's also attended the Academy in Arvo presenting and she's uh, uh, submitted three uh, papers already with several in publication. She is recruited to join the academic program as a faculty member at the, for the residency programs in ophthalmology and retina and vitreous fellowship at the University of Val del Calco in Cali, Colombia. And her goals for future include teaching research and clinical care. So she is, will tell you about one of the conditions that she's been studying, retinopathy prematurity and about it in Colombia. Thank you, Dr. Park. Thank you, Dr. Harnett, for that great uh, introduction. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. It's a honor for me to present today at Grand Rouse this project that was developed in my country. We are to, we are, I am going to talk about the prevalence of retinal pathy of prematurity in my country, Colombia. So thanks to the co-authors who collaborated with the development of this project, this presentation or the, the results of this project were presented at the last Arbo meeting in 2022 in Denver, Colorado. Prematurity is a problem that is, has been increasing over time and affects children around the world, especially in developing countries and in Latin America and the Caribbean. Retinopathy and prematurity is one of the leading causes of childhood blindness in Latin America and the Caribbean. And when we compare the impact of retinopathy or prematurity in high income countries with Latin America and the Caribbean, we observe that the number of the babies that survive and have ROP can in, in, in high income countries, they can have better outcomes of visual acuity compared to Latin America and the Caribbean. So in other words, in Latin America, the probability of getting blind from retinopathy or prematurity is higher compared to high income countries. This is my country, Colombia, located in South America. And as we can observe in this graph, we can observe how over the time, what is the behavior of the number of light birds over time since 2007 to 2016. So as we can observe in this graph, the number of light birds have have been decreasing. But if we observe the blue line, what we see is that the blue line that corresponds to the percentage of ROP over time, it's actually has presented a sustained increase during the last five years, which can correspond to 10 premature babies for every 1,000 live births. In Colombia right now, or to this date, we just have two studies that have been published about the epidemiology of this disease in the country. They have reported uh, the prevalence of ROP as 7.7% and 18.2%. 
actually little is known about the epidemiology of retinopathy of prematurity in Colombia. And that's why we want, decided to do this study in order to know more about the epidemiology of this problem in my country. So the objective of this study was to report the mean gestational age, the birth weight, and the risk factors associated to development of ROP in, in three different centers for three different cities from my country. Colombia is a country that has 50.88 million of inhabitants, and we already have 182 neonatal intensive care units around the country. Those NICUs are located in 23 of the 32 states of Colombia, and they are mostly located in the center of the country and on the west coast, as we can observe in this uh, picture. This was a retrospective study, and we collected data from charts from babies that were screened, screened from 2010 and 2020 in three different cities of the country, Bucaramanga, Medellin, and Bogota. And the reason we chose those programs is because we had more confidence about the quality of the data from those programs. What were the screening criteria that we took into account for this study? Infants screened at 32 weeks or less of gestational age. Infants with 1,500 grams or less of birth weight. And those infants that didn't uh, accomplish those criteria because they were more, more than 1,500 or more than 32 weeks of gestational age, but the neonatologist that was in charge of those babies recommended to do the screening of ROP because they presented risk factors for development of ROP. The evaluation was performed using indirect ophthalmoscopy during the fourth and six weeks of life. And the diagnosis and severity of the disease was uh, based on the classification of ROP second edition. We didn't use the ICROP3, the one that was published recently because this study was performed before the, 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 the publication of that one study. What were the variables we took into account for, the, for this presentation for this project? The gestational age, birth weight, sex, the presence of ROP, the stage of ROP, the different risk factors associated, including supplemental oxygen, trick pregnancy, procopulmonary dysplasia, sepsis, perinatal surgeries, intraventricular hemorrhage, and finally preeclampsia. This is the statistics. We, we used a student t-test and she squared test to, sorry, to do the anal analysis of the data. And also because we wanted to evaluate the association of risk factors to, with the development of ROP, we adjusted the risk factors of the patients with, uh, by gestational age, by birth weight, and severity of ROP. In total, we screened 1,691 infants. From those, 43% were, percent were male and 50 seven percent were females. The mean gestational age of those screened babies was 32.44 weeks and the mean birth weight was 1,536 grams. The prevalence of retinopathy or prematurity in this study was 17.5 percent because we found 310 infants with ROP from the whole sample and they presented a mean gestational age of 28.66 weeks with a mean birth weight of 1,230 weeks, 30 uh, grams, sorry. So in this table, we can observe the distribution of infants that presented any kind of ROP according to different groups of birth weight. So what we observe is in this second column, is that the number of screened infants, the most common group of patients according to the birth weight was in this row. And the infants that presented ROP were more likely uh, with, birth weight, with low birth weight that was less than 1,000 grams. 
in this pie chart, what we can observe is the distribution of the different stage of severity of ROP. And we found that the stage two was the most common in this study. What were the risk factors associated to the development of ROP? When we, when we tried to analyze that and we didn't do um, an, anal an analysis that took into account other variables, we found four different kind of risk factors. But after doing a logistic regression analysis adjusting by birth weight and gestational age, those risk factors got reduced. And finally, adjusting by birth weight, gestational age, and severity of ROP, we found that the risk factors associated to the development of ROP in this study were supplemental oxygen and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. The percentage of infants that required treatment of ROP in this study was 13.2%. And in this table, we can observe the distribution of the birth weight according to the type of treatment. So what we found is that um, the ba the younger babies or babies with low birth weight require more treatment than the ones that had more birth weight. What are the key, key points of this talk? The percentage, of, the percentage of retinopathy or prematurity in this study was 17.5%. In patients with ROP, the mean gestational age was 28.66 28 weeks with a mean birth weight of 1,230 grams. And the main risk factors to the development of ROP in this study were supplemental oxygen and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. There are some studies in Latin America about the prevalence of retinopathy or ROP and in this one, we observed that the prevalence of any stage of ROP was considered or was ranged from 6.6% until 82% according to the country. The treatment, the requirement or the need to do treatment in ROP in this study in Latin America shows that can be as higher as 23.8%. In contrast, to our results in, in which we found that it was uh, 13%. Also, when we compare the results of this study to countries of high income countries like the United States, we observed that the prevalence of retinopathy or prematurity in this country is less, but also uh, we can find some similarities. For example, that the peak of frequency of ROP was in the group of, uh, or in the gray, in, in, sorry, in the range of birth weight between 750 grams and 999 grams, which uh, agrees with this, with the same results that we have in our study, because we found in our study that small babies had more risk of ROP. On the other hand, the risk factors that can be associated to, the, to ROP can be different among the countries. The risk factors in the United States for development of ROP are not, are not the same that occur in Asia or in Latin America, for example. So in my country, we found that the use of supplemental oxygen and bronchopulmonary dysplasia in this study were the most important risk factors. But here in the United States, the presence of female sex, the gestational age less than 36 weeks and a birth weight less than 2,000 grams were risk factors as well. Also, 8.31% of infants require treatment. In our study in Colombia, around 13% require treatment. And if we go back to the other study, the one that evaluated different countries in Latin America, we observed that the treatment warranted ROP was 23.8 cases. So what means is that, of course, there are differences between countries. And the important thing here is try to identify what we can do to act in all those differences to reduce the burden of the disease. What are the future directions? This was a retrospective study. So any kind of retrospective study has limitations. The evolution of ROP was not evaluated in this, in this study. We didn't evaluate if the, if how many patients presented a reactivation of ROP or progression to 
um, more severe stages of ROP like retinal detachment. Also, there are other risk factors that can be uh, implied in the development of ROP or severity. And we, 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 those risk factors could have taken into account, maybe in future studies we can do it. For example, the extra uterine growth restriction, fluctuations in oxygen tension and maternal factors, and man, many other factors that have been identified in the development of ROP and severity of the disease. Finally, uh, this study doesn't show the whole sample of Colombia. We chose uh, the three centers that we consider the best for us, that we consider in which we could find the best availability of information. However, is the best study, I mean, so far is the best study in my country, which you just have to. So this is the third one, is, is multicentric, is the first study multicentric. And we hope that in the future, we can have more research and more studies to understand what is the behavior of retinopathy or prematurity in Colombia and what we can do to uh, work on all those risk factors to reduce the burden of the disease. The conclusions is that the prevalence of retinopathy in Colombia in this study was lower compared to other Latin American countries in which the prevalence is, is uh, up to 80%, around 20%, the average. The gestational age and low birth weight are risk factors to ROP as reported in, in the United States. The supplemental oxygen and bronchopulmonary dysplasia are risk factors that can be targeted of modification or treatment to reduce the prevalence of ROP. So what we have to do, or what we might do in our country is to understand that maybe we are using the oxygen incorrectly, or maybe we can work on that or study that in order to reduce the number of babies with ROP and their severity. What other future directions do we have? This is Cali, Colombia. So after finishing my program, I'm gonna be working in an university hospital, Valle del Cauca, and at, at the University of Valle, Cali, Colombia which is this building that we can observe here. This is Cali. And I am from Bucaramanga, which is located right here. Bogota is the capital city, and this is the place where I am going to go. My purpose in Colombia is to teach all the things that I have been learning during this time, during this training, and to provide a specialty that we don't have in Colombia so far, which is pediatric retina. So I think that there is a lot, a lot of work to do. It's challenging, but I am very excited to provide the opportunity of other people to be trained to, to learn and to improve maybe in the future our, um, or to make an important impact maybe in the future in our children's side. In addition, training in this institution that provides lots of educative clinic and research opportunity was incredible. I am very grateful for having the opportunity of staying here, for, staying here for almost one year. And also I have to say thank you for providing the support and guidance for me to be, for me to do or receive the best education as possible. So thanks to the outreach uh, division, global outreach division here. Also, I had the opportunity of making new friendships Thanks again to the residents, fellows, and all people that have supported me and helping me here. And for her mentorship, effort, commitment to my education, support, and kindness, I have to be very grateful with my professor, Dr. Hernet, for allowing me to stay here and for being so kind to teach me all this time. All those things have contributed to my academic, professional, and personal growth. And I am so happy to come back to my, to go back to my country and I face this challenge of starting a new pediatric retina service there. Muchas gracias. So, um, 
This is a question that I've always had in regards to subjects of this magazine, and if it's not answerable in some sense, it's important to me to bring it up. <clears throat> Do you know roughly what percentage of births and deaths are done in the informal sector? It should be births that are not going to the hospital, that are not, not necessarily stating but, but are happening in smaller communities in the West by uh, local people. I think that's a great question. And um, in my eyes, I think that is not very high right now compared to previous years. I think most of the population in Colombia is located in the center of the country, which we have big cities, which we have good hospitals. So we actually less of the population is, is living in the jungle or in other areas that are very far from the center of the country. But it, I would say just 5% of the population would be in that, uh, in that percentage. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. So According to the first question, so how or what, what is the, um, how easy it is to get access to treatment, anti-VGF, laser for us? We do have access to those kind of treatments because we have all those equipments and things that we need. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult because of the health system. Most of the patients uh, are a, uh, so that most of the patients have health system insur health insurance, and they can access to the different um, different treatments. But sometimes it, those are delayed. So that is one of the first challenge because we do have the resources, we do have the tools. The problem is that maybe we need more organization, more administrative work to 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 provide those tools to uh, the general population. And according to the second questions about imaging or other imagine, imagine results or, or imagine resources or other kind of tools that I saw here in the United States, and maybe we don't have in my country, we do have imaging, but for sure the United States is, is leadership in research, is leadership in, 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 in innovations, you know? So right now we are, do, the, the way that we are doing a screening of ROP in my country is to, is to the clinical way is to do indirect ophthalmoscopy. That's the way that we are doing. We do have red cams, we do have imaging. Actually, we have an optos camera in Bogota, but uh, for sure we need more organization in order to provide the possibility of taking those images to the more amount of babies. Um, it's challenging, yes. Uh, but I think that what I have to do is go there and to do an evaluation of the thing, of the needs that we have and try to do how can we make it work. For those 182, NICUs that we have around the country, I would say that just 10 are with a residence program. So just 10 have a residency program in ophthalmology training there. So most of them what don't have like a direct coverage for an ophthalmologist. So what we have to do is to uh, send an ophthalmology to send uh, a, a person that is trained in ROP to screen those places. Because, because it's not like that. We, we don't have an ophthalmologist in the service all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Gracias.
All right, we're going to transition a little bit. Many of you have not met Nate Gephardt. He's our current Global Outreach Fellow. He's currently on assignment in Mwanza, Tanzania. Um, we're going to be, we've, uh, I think, pre-recorded his talk. Uh, Ethan will be bringing that up to our stream here shortly. And as he's bringing that up, Nate will be trying to join us for at least Q&A uh, remotely. He's currently doing a FACO training with some attendings there at Bugando Medical Center. Uh, but Nate comes to us. He finished his medical school in 2012 at the University of Colorado then went on to Brooklyn for his internship and completing his ophthalmology residency at UC Davis in 2016. Since his graduation from Davis, he's been an attending staff at KCI Institute, OHSU. And I asked Nate a very simple question. You know, you've been traveling around the world for a while now. And what was your favorite dish? What's your favorite food so far? Was it the momos in Nepal? Was it the tikka masala in India? And Nate had a great answer. He basically said that so far, his favorite food has been the chicken nuggets at Mwanza Water Park. So you can tell Nate's uh, a little bit homesick, ready to come home. He will be joining us shortly in a week or so. He'll be coming back to Utah to, uh, to take some call and to do some administrative things and to get ready for the second portion of his uh, year in Tanzania. So we're gonna go ahead and play his presentation. He'll be speaking on adult strabismus challenges. Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Nate Gebhard. I'm the current Moran Global Ophthalmology Fellow and a visiting instructor from KCI Institute at OHSU in Portland, Oregon, where I've been on faculty for the past five years. Uh, just to give you a little background about myself, uh, it's been a dream of mine to pursue a global ophthalmology fellowship ever since residency, but the stars never really aligned until uh, recently when uh, my department uh, approved a one-year sabbatical and uh, I was able to arrange this fellowship uh, with Moran. Uh, and I'm so grateful to be a part of the Moran family. Um, this year has been an amazing year and it's it's taken a lot of uh, planning and preparation, and I am in, indebted to so many people at Moran for helping to make this possible, uh, namely Lori McCoy, Jeff Petty, Craig Chaya, uh, Abdul Khalid Barbar, uh, Erica Ruiz, and many others. So I just want to thank you all for uh, helping me uh, make my dream a reality. And once again, I'm excited to be with you all this morning in spirit. Uh, I'm pre-recording this uh, presentation from Wanza, Tanzania, where uh, my family and I are currently residing. So let's get started. On December 30th, uh, our family of four packed all of our bags uh, and left our home in Hood River, Oregon and set off for Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, we packed everything we would need for this entire year into these six bags, and uh, we were off. This is a family photo here on the left. Uh, that's uh, my wife, Annalisa, and my son, Silverton, who's seven years old, and my daughter, Louisa, who is four. So uh, I'm just going to take you on uh, a little journey uh, to Kathmandu. This is me and the kids sleeping on the plane. Uh, this is Kathmandu through the airplane window as we were about to land. And on the right, this is uh, the picture of Nima House in Kathmandu, where many, many Moran uh, faculty and fellows and residents have stayed over the years. So here's our first morning in Kathmandu, uh, me and the kids on the roof of Nima House. And the purpose of starting off this fellowship in uh, Kathmandu, Nepal, was to begin with uh, an SICS course at Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology. Uh, it's been a dream of mine for many years to visit Tilganga, uh, the Shangri-La of global ophthalmology, and uh, I was just so grateful to 
uh, have that opportunity. Um, this is my ID badge on the left, which uh, I will probably keep forever uh, and as a souvenir. And uh, on the right, this is a picture of me and my Mongolian ophthalmologist friend, Baisa, uh, who just happened to be finishing his own SICS course uh, as I arrived. So Tilganga is an amazing place. Uh, many Moran faculty have visited Tilganga over the years, and, and many Tilganga faculty have visited Moran. Um, there's been an ongoing partnership and affiliation, uh, which has uh, been ongoing. And so many of you might recognize some of these faces. Uh, these are some of my mentors uh, who helped me with my SICS training. This is Dr. Ben Limbu on the left and Dr. Saga Ruit on the right, um, who is uh, Sanda Ruit's son. Uh, after spending about a week at Tilganga, uh, we went on an outreach trip uh, to Sinduli. Sinduli is a, a province to the south and east of Kathmandu. It's about an eight or nine hour bus ride. And so uh, our family and I uh, joined the uh, Tilganga outreach team, loaded up the bus, and uh, we uh, drove over windy mountain passes, forded creeks and streams, as you can see here in the uh, left-hand photo, and we finally made it to Sinduli, uh, specifically a small municipality called Lampantar, and uh, this is where we conducted our uh, outreach. As you can see, uh, the Tilganga team brought all of the surgical equipment and instruments that they would need for the surgical camp. Uh, it's a very basic uh, setup uh, with microscope, table, instrumentation. Uh, in the center, you can see the small community hospital where we set up the surgical uh, camp. And then on the right, this is uh, us going into the hospital on that first day. So in Sinduli, uh, my two mentors, uh, Dr. Rojita and Dr. Sanjita, uh, were able to mentor me uh, in SICS techniques and also uh, were able to complete uh, over 120 SICS uh, cases themselves. So not only were they teaching me, but they were also uh, doing pretty high volume uh, cataract surgery during those three days. Um, in the uh, pictures here you can see Dr. Rojita and Dr. Sanjita uh, on post-op day one uh, checking um, patient's vision and uh, in the center uh, we have a picture of the operating theater and on the right hand side that's me and my family at the end of the the camp uh, where we're posing with uh, some gifts that uh, some government officials had had given to all of the participants. Here's another picture of me with Dr. Rojita and Dr. Sanjita, who were wonderful, wonderful mentors. And uh, just a couple other photos of uh, Sinduli. It's a beautiful. Um, beautiful uh, place, uh, lush green uh, fields, um, mountains, lots of goats. <laughs> you can see uh, me posing here with my son in uh, a goat pen. And uh, here's another family photo from that Sinduli trip. Um, after we got back to Kathmandu, um, Annalisa, my wife, uh, continued homeschooling the kids. You can see her homeschooling here on the roof of Nima House. And here's just a typical picture of the fair at the Tilganga Canteen. We really loved our time in, in Kathmandu. Um, it was a very fruitful and productive time for me uh, professionally, uh, but also personally. Um, I experienced a lot of growth. Um, and. We as a family also got to experience a lot of uh, culture. You can see my daughter and son here at the Swayambhuna Temple, yeah, or the Monkey Temple in Kathmandu. Um, and uh, after one month in Kathmandu, 
we journeyed to Hatauda, uh, which is uh, about a four to five hour Jeep ride to the south of Kathmandu. So we loaded everything up into this Jeep, drove over some more mountain passes, and then uh, arrived in Hatauda. You can see this is Hatauda Community Eye Hospital in the center photograph. That's my son on his bike posing in front of the hospital. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see a picture of all of the auto rickshaws that uh, zoom up and down the streets, and that's how we would get around town most of the time. So, uh, Hitauda Community Eye Hospital is an affiliated hospital uh, of Tilganga, uh, and so they basically operate uh, with uh, a similar philosophy and model. Um, they are committed to outreach um, and committed to reaching uh, patients in underserved areas and um, they do a really good job of, of reaching those communities. Uh, as opposed to Tilganga, uh, Hitauda Community Eye Hospital typically conducts its outreaches um, without doing the um, surgery in those locations, but rather they they bring the patients um, by bus back to the community eye hospital for surgery. In this slide, uh, I think I'm posing here with the operating theater staff, and that's Dr. Sunil, who is my uh, principal mentor uh, that month uh, on my right. As I was mentioning, um, Hatauda Community Eye Hospital does a lot of outreach, um, just like Tilganga does. Uh, this was uh, one of our outreach trips. I'm posing here with Cecile, who uh, is one of the outreach coordinators. And so we screened um, 100 plus patients and uh, those who were eligible and good candidates for cataract surgery, uh, we transported back to Hitauda, uh, where we performed their cataract surgeries. And this was, again, a great opportunity for me to uh, learn from my mentors uh, in the center photo. Um, you can see me being mentored by Dr. Sunil in SICS Techniques. And uh, these are the ophthalmic technicians uh, preparing uh, post-op medications and eye patches um, and taking care of the patients on post-op day one. Okay, so uh, that concludes uh, our journey through Nepal, both in Kathmandu and uh, Hatauda. Um, the next stop uh, was Tanzania. So after spending a month in Hatauda, uh, we took a jeep back to Kathmandu where I left uh, my wife and two kids at Nima House and I flew to Tanzania to meet up with Jeff Petty uh, as pictured here in the center and the rest of the Moran Global Outreach Team. Uh, on the left hand side uh, is a photo of Bugando Medical Center, the primary place where we collaborate with our um, uh, Tanzanian ophthalmology uh, partners and uh, on the right hand side uh, is a picture of the FACO uh, machine that we typically use on these outreach trips, the Ortley Cataracts, uh, which I found to be an amazing FACO machine, uh, which packs a lot of punch for such a small, uh, compact, and portable machine. So uh, here we are, the Moran Global Outreach Team, with uh, some of our Bugando partners. Uh, by the time I arrived in Mwanza, uh, Tanzania, where, where Bugando Medical Center is located. Uh, the Moran team had already been there for a week. Uh, Dr. Hoffman had been doing uh, pediatric ophthalmology a training week with Dr. Evarista, the pediatric ophthalmologist at Bugando. So I joined uh, the rest of the Moran team uh, for the second week, where we primarily focused on cataract surgery and uh, as uh, shown here, uh, the Moran team uh, worked in collaboration with our Tanzanian uh, 
ophthalmologist partners uh, to conduct this uh, program and to screen patients for cataract surgery and to perform their cataract surgeries this week. A couple more photos of our uh, partners at uh, Bugando. Um, and this is Dr. Christopher Mwanan Sao. He's the head of the ophthalmology department at Bugano Medical Center in Mwanza. And uh, he's such a wonderful uh, person and physician. Uh, he really is the, the person who facilitates uh, these Moran uh, outreach trips to Bugando, and uh, he's been an amazing partner uh, for for Moran, and uh, I now count him, count him as a, a dear friend. Uh, after the Moran team left, I stayed behind for a few days uh, looking for housing for uh, my family and uh, looking at different schools that my kids could attend for when we uh, would return. And uh, Dr. Christopher uh, and his family had me over for dinner, so we are here uh, posing outside of his house uh, the afternoon they had me over for dinner. Um, all of the, the department uh, staff are such wonderful people, and uh, Moran uh, is, is so lucky to have uh, such a, a wonderful group of people uh, at Bugando as, as uh, collaborators and partners. I, I felt very, very privileged and very honored to, to have uh, had the opportunity to work with all of them. So after our uh, Moran outreach trip in Tanzania, uh, I flew back to Kathmandu uh, where my wife and kids were waiting and we bid farewell to our Nepali friends. This is Nima and Pemba, uh, the owners and operators of Nima House, who many of you may recognize. That's my daughter posing with them. Uh, this is Krishna in the center photograph uh, presenting me with my SICS certificate from Tilganga. And uh, then uh, me and the kids touring some temples on the right. And then uh, the last week of March, uh, it was time to pack our bags again. And uh, we were off to India. So here are a few photos of my wife and kids at the airport. And here's my son Silverton uh, learning his Indian geography. He's pointing to Madurai in the southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu, where we would spend the next month at Arvind Eye Hospital, who I'm sure all of you uh, are, are very familiar with. Um, so this was uh, where we would spend uh, the month of April. Uh, Aravind, as I'm sure you all know, uh, has for many decades been an epicenter of global ophthalmology and they've done pioneering and groundbreaking work in uh, global ophthalmology outreach and in reaching underserved and marginalized communities and, uh, and uh, providing them access to high quality and affordable um, cataract surgery and other ophthalmic care. Uh, it's also been a dream of mine uh, for many years to visit Ardavind and I was so grateful uh, to our Moran partners and our Ardavind partners for helping to facilitate this and make it happen. On the left hand side uh, I'm standing with uh, my uh, SICS mentor at Ardavind, Dr. Avitesh and Dr. Jenna uh, who is the current Global Ophthalmology Fellow uh, at the Seva Foundation in San Francisco. We just happened to coincide uh, the same month for our SICS courses. And that's my daughter there as well. Uh, so Arvind is famous for its outreach, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, we had the opportunity to go on several outreach trips, um, visit several vision centers, and to visit one of 
Aravind's uh, secondary hospitals um, that they are building. It, Aravind these days is a vast network of multiple hospitals, secondary hospitals, vision centers, and uh, a very uh, well-oiled machine of uh, of outreach programs that uh, basically covers all of Tamil Nadu and other parts of uh, South India. So uh, this is one of the outreach trips uh, where all these patients are seated uh, on the left-hand photo, uh, screening patients in the center photo, and then that's just me standing in front of the Arvind Eye Hospital original building in Madurai. So we did have time for a few family field trips. Um, I've uh, never worked so hard in my life as I did at Aravind. It's In India, they just work so hard. It's a six-day work week from dawn to dusk, and so uh, often I felt like I was neglecting my... Uh, uh, family uh, duties and responsibilities as I was uh, training at Arvind, but we, we still did manage to have some family fun. Uh, this is my daughter and uh, my wife Annalisa on the left at the Chitrai Festival, which is uh, the big festival uh, in April in Madurai. Uh, in the center, this is us, uh, I think, posing in an auto rickshaw. And then on the right hand side, it's my two kids in front of the uh, famous Minakshi Temple in Madurai. So the SICS course at Arvind uh, was also um, just an excellent uh, training uh, experience. Um, this is Dr. Madhu Shikhar presenting me my certificate at the end of the course. Um, uh, Arvind has SICS training um, down to a science. They have uh, surgical simulators, they have uh, goat eyes every single day in the wet lab for their trainees. Um, they have surgical mentors and almost daily uh, training cases. And so by the end of the four weeks at Arvind, um, both Dr. Jen and I were, were feeling uh, much more comfortable and much more confident in our SICS uh, skill set. As you can see here on the left, this is uh, me at the uh, Help Me See Surgical Simulator. Um, and a couple more random photos. That's me and Dr. Shankar at his coconut farm. Uh, he supplies coconuts for uh, the hospital. And uh, this is on the right hand side. Uh, during the Chithrai festival. All right, so where are we now? Uh, my wife and kids and I are now back in Mwanza, Tanzania, and uh, I'm currently working with our Bugando partners and Lori McCoy on enhancing the efficiency and the quality of care in uh, the clinic and surgical theater. Uh, Lori McCoy was here for about two weeks and uh, just recently left and um, did a lot of work uh, helping to streamline uh, their uh, clinics and to um, um, help them prepare for the moving into their new building. Uh, now, um, one, one of the other things that we have started doing is uh, phase one of uh, our FACO training with Dr. Mwan and Sao. So uh, Dr. Mwan and Sao, the head of the department, uh, does have some uh, background in FACO. Um, in their new building, they will have a FACO machine. It's, it's in the storage room, uh, ready uh, to be used as soon as they move in. And so one of the primary um, objectives of, of me being here uh, several times this year and for my extended stay later this year is to uh, help Dr. Mwan and Sao and Dr. Evarista uh, along in their FACO training. And I, I'm really excited about this and I, I'm excited about um, the skills exchange that, that will uh, be taking place and already has taken place. Um, I've learned so much from them surgically and clinically. They um, 
are masters of SICS, and so I've been learning so much uh, in terms of SICS and other ophthalmic surgery, and uh, I'm happy to play a small role in helping them to uh, become more uh, proficient FACO surgeons. So fellowship goals and plans. Uh, so for the remainder of the seven months of my fellowship, uh, we've got quite a bit planned. Uh, I'm going to be participating in uh, some of the Navajo Nation outreach trips, uh, I think with Dr. Chaya and Petty. Uh, we have the Global Ophthalmology Summit in Park City in August. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, from August to December, I'll be going back to Mwanza uh, with my family and we'll be uh, staying there for an extended stay to really work with our partners uh, in uh, a longitudinal uh, FACO course and uh, also working on different research projects and skills exchange. Uh, also we'll be uh, helping them uh, facilitate the move into their new building and uh, hopefully getting their new FACO machine and uh, operating theater up and running. Uh, obviously, I'm excited to continue my education in global ophthalmology. Um, I'm really interested in social determinants of health and barriers to health care, uh, particularly in ophthalmology, and I've already learned so much uh, from Tilganga and Arvind and from our partners at Bugando of how um, healthcare systems uh, can deliver eye care to uh, under-resourced and under-served areas. Um, and it's just been an amazing education and uh, I, I feel so grateful to uh, have had this opportunity uh, to work with these partners and, and learn from them. Um, next point, uh, I have uh, finished two SICS courses, one at Tilganga and one at Arvind, and I hope to continue to hone my SICS skills um, throughout this uh, coming year uh, working in Tanzania, and also hope to pursue some additional collaborations with uh, some of our other partners in Mongolia and uh, possibly American Samoa and uh, Micronesia. And last but not least, uh, my post-fellowship goals and plans. I'll be returning to Casey in January of 2023 after I conclude my fellowship. And uh, when I return, uh, I plan to continue working with Mitch Brinks, uh, who many of you probably know. Uh, he's done a lot of uh, global ophthalmology work over the years, and uh, particularly in the South Pacific. And uh, I hope to pursue additional collaborations and potential synergies between Casey and Moran and global ophthalmology out outreach work. Uh, I would love to continue to support uh, our Moran partners in Tanzania, Mongolia, and elsewhere. Um, it's been a pleasure being with you this morning in spirit. Um, and uh, if any of you have any questions, uh, I will try to uh, call in. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Looks like Nate just logged on. <laughs> so we have just a few minutes, Nate. Wow, yeah. that was good timing. I just barely logged in. Awesome, perfect timing. Well, we've got just Can a you few- Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you, Nate. Can you hear us? Are you there, Nate? I'm sorry, what was that, Craig? Okay, I was just wanting, making sure that you could hear us, but we've got just a few minutes. We just finished up your presentation. Uh, I apologize, I had introduced you as talking about strabismus. I was questioning that in my mind, if you're really going to be talking about strabismus, but uh, I'm just talking about the business talk I heard. Uh, <laughs> in, in any case, uh, Nate, maybe you could just uh, entertain a few questions. Any questions from the audience here that they have? Sure, happy to answer any questions. How are things going for you there so far? Great, great. Uh, this is uh, my second time here in Tanzania this year, and the second time it's been about four weeks now, and we have uh, gotten our FACO training of Dr. Mwan and Sao underway. We just finished a couple of cases uh, this evening. Uh, 
in the, so we're still in the OR. Uh, we just discharged our, our last patient. Let me see if I can get some video. Maybe you can see uh, me and Dr. Wan and Sao here. Is anyone able to see the video yeah. or no? Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> So there's Dr. Wan and Sao. Here's Dr. Nuru. <laughs> and Baraka. Baraka. And uh, uh, Dr. Salima. <laughs> <laughs> Our OR staff. Well, Nate, you've had a busy uh, early part of your fellowship so far. Uh, we're thrilled to have you come back for a short period of time so we can reconnect and regroup for the second half of your year. Uh, but thank you so much for presenting your uh, tour so far and the impact that you've had in different locations. And so we'll reconnect when you come back to Salt Lake. Okay, appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you all uh, in, in a couple weeks. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody, for attending Grand Rounds this morning. And we look forward to connecting with you more on our uh, global outreach plan for the year. Thank you. Thank you.